Um, my name's Charlie Banner, Keating Chabers. Um, and um, can I start by reminding our viewers to um, consider making a charity donation in lieu of registration fee? We have a whole range of uh, charities we support, details of which and links to which are on our um, on our website, www.hwgpnfy. We've got planetyfute.com. Um, or, of course, make a... It uh, doesn't sound so good as it looks, does it, when you read it out like that? Um, uh, um, or, or, of course, make a donation to a charity of your choice. Now, we are um, delighted this evening to be welcoming uh, Chris Lever, um, um Group Planning Manager at Barrett's here to talk about the CMA report uh, on the house building sector, um, a, um, a hugely important document which has been uh, much discussed recently. So, Chris, we're hugely looking forward to hearing your uh, input uh, and comments on that in an interview led uh, by um, by Paul. Wonder where Paul is today. We shall soon find out. Where is Paul? Who's that? <laughs> uh, 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 I'm going to pay homage. Invaded uh, 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 uh. my room. So thank goodness I have. He's in my pupil desk. Uh, <laughs> there. Um, now, first and foremost, let's uh, introduce. Uh, well, I should say first of all, Chris, where are you darling us? What were you calling us from today? Um, chosen anything with our theme, and uh, what if anything are you drinking? So, uh, dialing in from Barra's East London office, uh, over in Stratford in Heary, so just by the Olympic Park, a really great setting. Um, and I've, I've got a very nice lemon and ginger herbal tea. Ah, that's <laughs> very wholesome of you. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed for coming. And obviously, as I always say, is there anything uh, you'd like to comment uh, on any of our case reports before we um, have the interview? Feel free to do so, although no obligation. Um, Mary, different angle for, I can't quite work out with you at home, town legal or somewhere. Else. I, I am in one of the new pods in town legal's refurbished offices. So, uh, good evening, Charlie. Lovely to see you. Welcome to the show, Chris. Chris Weber, as opposed to, uh, Chris, the lovely Chris Young. And, uh, yeah, I'm lo- really looking forward to, um, the interview later. Lovely. Great to see you, Mary. Sasha, um, you're in a sauna by the look of it. You're not the first to say that today. <laughs> it's actually my hotel room decor. <laughs> we believe you. Not. I'm in the delights of Courchevel skiing, which I thought Mary might still be with me, but no. But um, I'm yes, I'm in. I'm in a slightly more glam. I'm only showing you my hotel room because I'm proving that it's nicer than Chris's. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, great to see you, Sasha. Chris, you have one of, I think, as far as I can see, you have behind you one of my favourite pieces. Is that David Hockney's Pair Blossom Highway? It is, yes. Although uh, I obviously don't have any, I don't have any original Hockneys, uh, but um, that is from my room in Chambers. I'm moving between Chambers um, whilst, I'm still at number five, but we're moving to the new <laughs> building. And um, I am uh, in a hotel in Maidenhead. I'm in the Royal Ascot Suite, obviously. Um, and uh, we we had a theme. Uh, have we asked Chris about his theme? What is the theme, Chris? I did ask. I didn't get an answer. I didn't like to say. Can oh, you... sorry. Uh, we're not allowed to do that on this show. Oh, no, terribly. Uh, no, my theme is adventure holidays. Uh-huh. And uh, me and my wife have, have got a real kind of love for adventure holidays, going to exotic places, always hit the theme on the head, um, going to a lot of different countries and doing a lot of very adventurous things, so jumping off. Um, cliffs, canyoning, coast earring, zip lining, and um, doing what I found out earlier in the year was a Tarzan jump, which is essentially just go on a platform above the tree line and just do a straight 45 meter drop down um, before you start swinging. So anything like that is uh, it's just fantastic. So I thought it was a great thing. I'm, I'm very, I, I need to know what you were wearing when you were doing that Tarzan jump. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least uh, Sasha's always taking the seat there. So you've actually gone on another ski holiday in order to give effect to the theme. Uh, uh, and do ask Paul, please, Charlie. He's got that backdrop. Out. Do ask him. Yes, I'm going to have to. Uh, Paul, tell us about the backdrop. Uh, well, I, I hate adventure holidays. You're going to have to mute, Charlie, if I'm in the same room. Uh, I hate adventure holidays. Uh, that definitely isn't me jumping off the Zambezi Gorge uh, last summer. I wouldn't do anything so stupid. There are no crocodiles there. Uh, nor was I egged into doing it by my family. I go on beach holidays and nothing else, uh, Chris. But it's a delight to see you. And I have to say, Charlie, yeah. now you've re- now you've remembered the theme, Lonely Planet. Anybody else a fan of Lonely Planet? Oh yes, I, I have been to a hundred countries using Lonely Planet. I absolutely love it. I love your theme. 
And um, I particularly like deserts. So that's why I've got my David Hockney. Uh-huh. Uh, Dawson. Anyway, we've almost <laughs> remembered to do the order right, Charlie. Almost. 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 Thanks, mate. Um, now, um, I think I've... Uh, I haven't got anybody. Oh, wait. No, hooray. Um, in which case, um, we're going to start with Marks and Sparks. And who bad? That's about the decision uh, than Mary Cook. Thank you very much, Charlie. So this is a, a decision of uh, Natalie Levin, Jay, allowing a Section 288 challenge and quashing the Secretary of State's dismissal of m ss Section 78 appeal for the construction of a new nine-storey mixed office and retail store um, at the western end of Oxford Street. In other words, the redevelopment of their flagship, um, their current flagship store. Now, there were six grounds to this challenge. Um, the first ground was that the Secretary of State had erred in respect of paragraph 152 of the National Planning Policy Framework when he said in paragraph 24 of the decision letter that there is, and I quote, a strong presumption in favour of repurposing and reusing buildings. There is, in fact, no mention of the word presumption in what was then paragraph 152 of the MPPF, which is now 157 of the um, the December 23 version. And that's the one that talks about the planning system supporting the transition to a low carbon future in a, a climbing in a changing climate, taking full account of um, various risks. So that was the first ground of, of the challenge. And as I say, the claimant pointed out that there wasn't actually a the word presumption in that paragraph in the MPPF. Moreover, that there are paragraphs in the MPPF which do use the expression uh, presumption. And therefore, of course, if the draftsman wanted to create a presumption in relation to 152 now 157, um, he would have he would have done so, um, and the Secretary of State didn't have um, the submissions made on his behalf. Alleged that um, it was the stated intention of paragraph 152 to create radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and it was open. It was argued to the Secretary of State as a matter of planning judgment and weight to apply a policy presumption. Well, the judge wasn't having any of that. Um, she thought it was absolutely plain that the Secretary of State had misinterpreted the um, MPPF and therefore word in law, and that ground was successful. The second ground of challenge related to the consideration of, an alter- of alternatives, and here the inspector had concluded that there was no meaningful refurbishment which could achieve the planning policy objectives. And the judge said that whilst it would have been open to the Secretary of State to d- disagree with the expert inspector, this is David Nicholson, um, architect, it would have been open to the Secretary of State to disagree with that judgment. He would have needed to give adequate reasons as to why he disagreed. And in this particular instance, he had failed to give those adequate reasons. And so that ground of challenge was successful. Again, ground three, Secretary of State, uh, it was said, had erred in the balance of public benefits um, as against the heritage impacts. The judge found that there was an obvious inconsistency in the decision letter where, on the one hand, limited weight had been given to the potential harm to the vitality and viability of the area from a refusal, but yet significant weight uh, had been given to the benefits which would have been lost if, of course, the scheme did not proceed. So there was a sort of inconsistency, and again, that ground was successful. Ground four, the Secretary of State's conclusion on harm to the vitality and viability of Oxford Street um, was uh, uh, one upon which it was said that there was no evidential basis. Now, you may all recall that m and had said that they would leave. They would leave Oxford Street if they didn't get the planning permission. Um, and that if um, planning permission was not granted, the inspector concluded um, that that indeed would be harmful. That scenario would have been harmful to the vitality and viability of what is an international town centre. And once again, although the Secretary of State appeared to disagree, he didn't give adequate reasons. And so again, that ground was um, challenged. 
sorry, was successful. So ground five was all about embodied carbon. And this is where the judge said that the Secretary of State had become thoroughly confused on the difference between embodied carbon, which emanates from the construction of buildings, as distinct from carbon emissions, which emanate from the op operational phase of a development. And there's a London Plan Policy, uh, SI2, which relates, um, uh, which has a policy, an offsetting policy, and the Secretary of State said though that, that there was a breach of this policy, but that was because the Secretary of State mistakenly thought that that policy related to embodied carbon when it didn't. It actually related to um, carbon emissions during the operational um, phase of a, a development. And so, again, um, th this was uh, a successful ground of the challenge. So there was a sixth ground which uh, wasn't successful, but the challenge succeeded on all five grounds. So the matter is going to be remitted and we wait with interest to see what the final outcome will be and also what process, what if any process, i.e. a reopened inquiry, written reps, um, the Secretary of State decides to follow. Thank you very much, Charlie. Thanks, Mary. Um, and not the only um, judicial review uh, or staffing review to succeed in the last couple of weeks. Often said it's very difficult to, to get a planning call claim off the ground. Um, I'll the face of that decision that was challenged it looked like it might be difficult for marks and spencers but well done to the claimants team um and well done to um to the claimants team in the next case that i'm going to uh cover um it's been a um successful um fortnight for galloway ian galloway that is um ian galloway the claimant in a judicial review uh, or statute review of, of a decision by, by durham county council to to grant um planning permission for a solar farm uh, development uh, in the Durham uh, area. Uh, the, um, the ground of challenge, the grounds of challenge were uh, broadly focused on um, the um, size of the solar farm. Um, the claimant's concern um, w was that the, the scale of the infrastructure in question um, took it over the um, statutory threshold uh, of um, 50 megawatts um, for a solar farm to be a nationally significant infrastructure project. And, and the, so the, the claimant said, well, hang on, this is, a, in essence, an NSIP. It shouldn't have been granted by the county council pursuant to the local um, Town and Country Planning Act uh, uh, process. Uh, the response to that was, well, the, the nature of the permission was such that the infrastructure could only be used to the extent that it was below the statutory capacity, 49.5 megawatts, and therefore... Although, um, if the infrastructure was running at full pelt, not a term of art, but essentially at full pelt, it would it would be above the the conditions and uh, nature of the permission was such um, that it, it couldn't be used in that way, and therefore it was legitimate for them to um, to have granted permission under Town and Country Planning Act. Um, now, on that aspect of the case, uh, the judge, Mr. Justice um, Fordham. Uh, uh, rejected the the argument. What the judge uh, said, in, in essence, was that the claimant's approach to um, defining statutory capacity, uh, the capacity of the solar farm, which wasn't defined in legislation, um, was uh, was not a uh, leg legally mandatory approach, um, and um, that the, the approach they called they called the combined panels method of plotting up the potential capacity of the of the solar farm, and also that the conditions um, uh, and, and the plans which were tied into the uh, conditions um, of the planning mission were such that it couldn't uh, be used above the threshold. So that aspect, the claim failed. However, um, he, he, Mr Justice Vaughan went on to accept an alternative um, sort of, uh, line of challenge to the effect that this was an excessive use of the land in question because... The, essentially, the defence of the first ground, namely that the infrastructure, if it was applicant for pelt, would be above, but actually it was effectively dialed down. Um, the, the effect of that was um, was that the obviously material consideration, which the county hadn't taken into account and should have done, it was rational not to, was that too much land was being used in the solar farm because it didn't need to be that ex excessive um, because um, it was only being used below its technical capacity 
um, quite a clever and alternative argument, really, saying that the defence of the first argument proved too much. And for a variety of reasons set out in judgment, Mr Justice Forden accepted that argument and held that um, it was irrational, uh, essentially, of the uh, of the county council not to have taken that argument into account. Um, well done again to the claimant, because it's in that case, because it's, it's jolly hard uh, to, to make good an irrationality argument. Um, so Richard Harwood, Harwood, Casey and his team did very well. But it's an illustration, actually, both those cases that... Um, despite the um, well-documented difficulties of, of making good a claim uh, in the planning court, um, it is possible, including in this case, on, on rationality grounds. Um, so that's uh, that's Galloway. Um, and next, before we turn to the news and then uh, the interview, uh, next up, Sasha, you've got a planning appeal in Leicester. So over to you in your sauna. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, uh, yeah, I wish you were with me. <laughs> um now yes now you've talked about irrationality i i i'm literally putting forward a candidate for the bar midst appeal decision in the lifetime of have we got planning use to you i'll tell you a few reasons why this is charn wood charnwood borough council charnwood borough council have a plan which is from 2004 there is a application by Taylor Wimpy for up to 195 houses and surprisingly or maybe not unsurprisingly and I don't want to get on one of Chris's hobby horses but there was an emerging plan which has had an EIP which closed in November now just think what the emerging plan says about this site does it A shunt it into Siberia or does it B allocate the site for housing B, allocates the site for housing. So imagine we've got a planning inquiry in November, which is simultaneous with the closure of an EIP, where the site is allocated under draft policy HA3 for up to 195 dwellings. I'm trying to get my head around why this has gone to appeal. I mean, Chris will listen to this with interest, although it's another house builder, Taylor Wimby application. Uh, the reasons why why would the council object to? Well, apparently the main issue is whether the development accords with the council's development plan strategy. Now, remember what I said. This is a development plan from two thousand and four, which is a painful year for me because it was the last time Arsenal were champions. But it shows how long ago this plan was adopted. Two thousand and four, and I just I'm bemused why the council thought it was sensible, reasonable or any kind of sensible person would come to a view to take this to a planning inquiry, when apparently it's an allocation that they are supporting simultaneously in an EIP. Well, not unsurprisingly, the inspector said, all very interesting, but the tilt of balance, which is in play because, of course, the plan is so old, it's almost uh, vintage, but, of course, the inspector applies the tilt of balance and says the benefits are overwhelmingly in favour of the grant of consent. Well, only mystery, and I might be wrong about this, but apparently on the face of the um, report is there was no application for costs from Taylor Wimpy. That's the only mystery of this case, frankly. But it really is an example, of, and it's one of those that Chris loves, but an example, frankly, why it's slightly bemusing why it went to um, appeal. If anyone who was involved in that can illuminate us by um, putting something on the question and answer, I'll be interested. But um, frankly, it's a really it's a case study into why the planning system is failing with delivery. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Sasha. Um, and uh, we're now going to go to Chris's roundup of news stories, uh, which we've decided to do at the end of the session before interview. Uh, by yes, like complete design. It's all beautifully planned, Charlie. I'm sure. I'm sure he didn't forget at all. Um, I tell you why, uh, Sasha. Actually, I've been in uh, Charm with their EIP reopen, but but it doesn't undermine at all what you were saying. It was just a on a couple of discrete points, because the council have refused everything that is a draft allocation, everything. And the only way they've got through, as Paul knows, is you go to appeal. And the council just continually do this. And I don't honestly know what their rationale for it is. And now the plan's only 12 years, uh, because this has been going on, the examination has been going on for three years, the plan's only 12 years from adoption. Anyway, uh, my goodness, what a busy week. Uh, the government has announced, made all kinds of announcements in the budget. 
Uh, there's three millions for sk- three million pounds for skills and education to attract more planners into the profession. Twenty million pounds. Uh, I sound like a I don't know a, a Tory government minister. Twenty million pounds investment uh, in social finance uh, for building three thousand um, community led homes. That's six and a half thousand. Uh, per house. Uh, the government uh, is funding more local nutrients um, mitigation uh, to try and unlock 30,000 houses. Uh, there's money for Cambridge. Uh, there's money for Leeds. Um, class MA, which is part three of the GBDO, which is class E to class C3 uh, for the enthusiast. Um, and that is uh, now releasing Paragraph A, which is it needed to be vacant for a three-month continuous period. And paragraph C, which is the cumulative floor space cap of 1,500 square metres. There's been so much going on. But whilst the government's been busy doing that, and who knows, it could be an election coming. Um, at the same time, the consequences of their policies are being seen. So Spellthorn last week decided to delete 13 of their 15 sites in the Greenbelt. Solihull has decided one of the options is to abandon their plan and start all over again. So lots of investment from the government, um, but I'm afraid uh, things are starting to go wrong with local plans as a consequence of abandoning their, um, their housing targets. And finally, I have to mention the banner review on infrastructure. It was with uh, great enthusiasm Charlie um, was telling us about the continued value in um, judicial review but part of your investigation i think is to look at the success of these uh, judicial reviews and the effect they're having on the delivery of infrastructure and you're looking at planning and development so congratulations on your appointment um it'll be interesting to see what you say about the merits of judicial review um and um wow what a busy week Thanks, Chris. Oh, sorry. Bristol and St Albans became the first authorities to be put into special measures because of their speed of decision-making on um, non-major applications. And some might say that's just 14 years too late. Thanks, Chris. A, a quiet week, um, as, you, yes, as you say, in, in the field of planning. So, Chris Webber, Group Planning Manager at Barrett Developments, PLC. Um, uh, you have a first class degree in geography from the University of Reading. Now that tells me I'm starting to uh, to talk as if you've got uh, a job interview. You're not. You started as an assistant planner in Chelmsford uh, back as recently as August 2018. Uh, since when you've had a meteoric rise uh, uh, joining Barrett's East of England team in November 2021. And now you are group planning manager for the PLC, despite the fact uh, you ex- have extraordinary uh, uh, youthful good looks, uh, Chris. So firstly, what does your role entail? Uh, When was your last adventure holiday? And what's your secret? Uh, Well, firstly, flattery gets you everywhere, Paul. So thanks very much for that. Um, I'll tackle the last holiday first before I get into um, sort of professional life. But my last holiday was earlier this year to Costa Rica, um, which was absolutely fantastic. It's a a really kind of um, long held aspiration for me and my wife to go there. So we did a a two week kind of all in adventure holiday, uh, which was a fantastic group led loads of activities traveling across costa rica so yes and then turning to uh, my role as group planning manager uh, in barrett so i have had a my previous experience was very much development management over in east anglia um uh, managing uh, reserve matters full applications nmas the whole kind of spectrum uh for barrett in in that neck of the woods and then uh Yes, in November 2021, uh, kind of poached by um, our group land and planning director, Philip Barnes, uh, to be group planning manager um, at Barra. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it was a real upward step for me. It's been a massive learning curve. Um, but my role now is is very much twofold. One is, is much more internal. So it's working with our divisional teams, uh, making sure they are delivering planning permissions, promoting land uh, to allocation efficiently, and kind of providing them the support, guidance, anything they need internally, direct involvement in applications to, to help them do that. Um, and then more of the kind of external facing role, it's very much engaging with policy, going to meetings with government, with the HBF, LPDF, to try and um, steer that government policy and make sure Barra, as, as the largest national house, will have, uh, have an input and have helped to shape that. And then for much of last year, um, as you'll probably get on to, a large part of my role was uh, engaging with the CMA. So, Chris, um, 
So you were brought on board, um, uh, or we asked you to come on to talk about the uh, the Competition and Markets Authority report, which was published uh, last week. Uh, there's a further investigation which they've set in train, which we're not going to talk about because it's still live. But on the report that's been produced so far, what, what are the key conclusions for Barrett for, from the report, and particularly in relation to land use and planning issues? I think for, from our perspective, it is a very, very positive report. And I, I think it can't be kind of overstated the the robustness of that report. You know, the, the CMA have the power to go in to house builders, look at internal, doc- request internal documents, which they, they did so with Barrett, the huge amount of internal work um, collating and giving that over. So it's probably the most robust report probably ever conducted, at least in my lifetime, um, into house building. And then the conclusions they came to really was, you know, despite being out of scope in the initial review, despite Michael Gove explicitly saying you shouldn't be looking at planning, the planning system is now front and centre of why the house build, house building market has undelivered, why we're not meeting uh, our need, why we're not delivering 300,000 homes a year. So I think, you know, for that to be an outcome, first and foremost, that, you know, to go in saying you're not looking at planning and then to have planning system front and centre and to really echo a lot of what, what, I've said what Barrett said, what other house builders and the wider industry have said, and to have that backed up by such a robust report is is fantastic. So, planning aside, it also then looked into land banking, um, and that's a, a you know often wheeled out against house builders. And again, it was that was really good to see that you know the CMA having looked at everything internal, everything that we put together internally and and, and the wider industry do, and say land banking's not a problem; it is a symptom of the planning system we operate in. And I think their exact terms are, it's a rational response to the complexity and the uncertainty of the planning system. So house builders need to have those land banks, which again is is a really positive outcome and that we can uh, lean on and talk about. Um, Again, really positive to see there was no um, instances of um, uh, competition issues in any area of the UK. You know, it is an inherently competitive market. Again, really great to see. There was a, an interim um, kind of letter report um, issue that said there might be some areas um, of concern. They went away, looked at those areas, no concerns. So there's no competition issues in any area um, of the UK. And then I think probably lastly for me, it's it was just identifying that you know there needs to be more planning permissions coming out of the system. That's the only way we are going to increase the number of homes delivered and get to where we need to be. So it will come as no shock to any of our viewers, I think, that the problems uh, uh, that have been identified by the CMA reports are said to be that the planning system is hindering the delivery of homes. I'm sure that many of our viewers will be astonished by that conclusion. Um, so if the if the planning system is a key driver of underperformance, what, what are the biggest issues that have been identified by the CMA in terms of their recommendations? So, you know, overarching, it's got to be that there's just not enough coming out of the system. So, sorry, I'm kind of repeating myself what I just said, but, you know, that is fundamentally it. There is not enough coming out of the system to deliver 300,000 homes a year, which is the target we all need to get to. Um, I can't remember what, what year Litchfields um, did it, but there's a great Litchfields report that says we need, we need around 520,000 consent a year or consented units to come through, and we're nowhere near that. We're at the mid 200s, and that figure's been declining. You've only got to look at, you know, the data that's come out of the last couple of months, the last years, see that's on a downward uh, trajectory so that that is one of the key issues um identified secondly it is that complexity the uncertainty the time uh the, the kind of excessive time in the planning system as well and looking at some of the stats the cma will only 12 percent of applications i think were determined in time the average cost of an application it's between 100 and 900 thousand that's obviously a very wide ranging average and dependent on size but again you know those time delays so how that they're not determined in statutory time periods. The average time scale for a planning application is twelve months. Cost twelve months is costing you new up to nine hundred grand to get in. That is hugely exclusionary to a lot of market actors. People like Barrett, a lot of the you know a lot of more well-funded organisations can um, work within those parameters. There's a lot of SMEs, the kind of businesses we should be encouraging, cannot deal with that context. So again, a fundamental issue. Um, and then an interesting one was actually looking at the availability of land. That was a really interesting outcome in terms of, of planning land, saying actually the availability of land isn't really an issue. And I think it's 44% of England is potentially uh, developable or could, could, could come forward for development. Of that 44%, 10% is brownfield. So that already shows that you know a brownfield presumption or entirely brownfield only will not work, will not deliver the homes we need. And um, 
But actually, you know, to bring land forward, it's actually the planning certainty. If you don't, if you're going to be spending 12 months, 100 to 900,000, with no certainty, you're going to get a positive decision as a landowner or as a developer. Why would you bring that land forward? Yeah, it's it's interesting to drill into the stats, and it's certainly a, a report that I'd invite anybody interested in the planning system and why there's failure to drill into. But one of the uh, things I, I that struck me is that there's been separate reports issued by the CMA for England, Wales, and Scotland. They've not not covered Northern Ireland because it has a different system. Um, but I'm afraid I can't resist the temptation to note that the nation which has the closest thing to proper regional planning um, and the greatest clarity as to what housing requirements must be met is the one that's the closest to meeting its national housing target, which is a big, big up to the Scots. So uh, Sasha's team there in the rugby world. So is that worthy of note, do you think, Chris? I, I, th- I think it definitely is. Um, probably I would just say with a caveat. So I'll, I'll kind of tackle the the yes, why should be of note in a second. But I think it's, you know, it's important that you've got your starting points got to be none of the regions have a uh, housing target is actually truly reflective of need. And I know we're talking about, I'll go into Scotland in a minute, but, you know, looking at England, we've got a target of 300,000. All of the standard method only adds up to around 225. I believe, I think, without the uh, the, the arbitrary sort of urban uplift applied. So actually, that, that's got to be a starting point on that. I think we can't get away from needing that those national targets. But then actually what you've picked out in terms of uh, Scotland with that regional planning system is that they're actually, I think there's there's scope to adopt that and improve it, I think, across the rest of the regions. Because if you start with a strong national target, you can then feed that down into regional, you know, probably light touch regional plans within that. So you have that strong housing target and that is then set at a strong level and a very unambiguous level regionally as well. And I think that's where we can kind of build on the the Scottish model. So do we look at something like, uh, you know, harking back to the old kind of RPG guidance, very light touch, specific regions, whether that's, um, you know, urban areas and their surrounding authorities or something as big as the kind of Oxcam Arc or Oxfordshire, you know, regions to be determined. Um, But do we look at that that set those housing targets, that national target is distributed regionally. It then sets the economic, the infrastructure priorities for that region. And then all the all the local plans just feed into that. There then shouldn't be any talk around, well, who does what, who goes where. You've got a number, you've got your economic and your infrastructure priorities, everyone's got to meet it. And I think that that's probably a key lesson to be learned. Yeah, it's, it's that interim position between a national target of 300,000 and the local target for someone like Childwood, just based upon the standard methodology. They just need to know what your figure is and then go away and plan for it. Exactly. Um, this isn't rocket science. Um, now, developers do come in for criticism in the report, um, but... Uh, what what do, do you uh, read the commission uh, the competition market uh, 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 conclusion as to where the blame actually lies for the under delivery housing? Is it the developers? Is it the landowners? Or is it somewhere else? On your reading, yeah, I, I think you know, I, in terms of land and planning, I can obviously we really only talk about the areas where the CMA conclusions are really clear. I said land banking doesn't exist; it's a rational response um, to uh, to that. Um, uh, the planning system is not generating enough permissions. You know, there is um, uh, very valid points made in the CMA report around how developers build to local absorption rates and build rates, which I'm sure we'll we'll get into. But again, you can't get away from the, the, the model of house building in the UK is inherently speculative. It's tied to economic headwinds. It's tied to the laws of demand and supply in that we can't really get away from that. But fundamentally, you know, whether we talk about build our rates, we talk about speeding up the developer um how quickly developers build out sites you've got to have the next site ready to go on that and at the minute we're in a system that doesn't have that next site ready to go in there so i think it, you've got to hark back to that to essentially the planning system and making sure everything from top to bottom is um you know through a planned system is generating those sites coming through and how authoritative do you take this report to be I mean, is it up there with the Letwin report at, the, at that that calibre, or is it just yet another report that'll sit on a shelf? How, how do you read this? I, I, I very much hope it's it's should hold more weight than you know the Letwin review, um, Barker, those things, because of the uh, the powers that the CMA has. I said, I, as, as far as I'm aware, and feel free to correct me, I don't think you know Letwin will have the ability to go in and review internal house builder documents. So you know, you've got such a wide-ranging review all coming to the essentially the same conclusions that everyone has but this should be seen as so much more robust so i think we're just really hoping that the government will listen and that they will work with households they'll work with you know experts in the industry like 
like yourselves and, and you know the people listening to the call to actually look to deliver the recommendations there because this absolutely shouldn't sit on a shelf this this is must this is a must read for everyone in the industry to understand what's I going on just jump in and say it's it's wonderfully reassuring for me to know that paul has a sliding scale of authority authority of public review reports uh no pressure <laughs> i look forward to hearing where on the where on the sliding scale of the tucker uh, the, the tucker scale of my report ends up landing uh i i'm going to be the fifth on that one <laughs> <laughs> um okay so so one of the one of the points in the report is the, the issue about the emphasis on build out rates, which Mary's going to pick, pick up in terms of um, local absorption, etc. Um, but do you think this is going to lead to changes to require permissions to be built out within specific time limits? I, I believe it will. And I think I think that kind of probably goes, um, builds on some of the kind of rhetoric that's already been talked about. You know, you've had um, through, I think it was the levelling up, the Lura um, com- uh, commencement notices, completion notices. So I think we've already started to see that come through quite a lot so and, and i think this will only kind of embolden that and, and bring those uh those types of um uh, methods forward of trying to drive build out rates um but i think fundamentally it's it's great you can encourage developers or force developers so to speak to to build out um sites faster but you've got to have something that works alongside that so whether that is a diversity of tenure on site for example bringing in more players to the market deliver more units alongside that because if you increase those build up rates, all you're going to do is is increase the uh, basically increase the rate of when homes are delivered, not actually how many homes are going to be delivered, because you'll come to the same um, end point, which is well, great, I was forced to do that site faster. Where's my next one? It's not there. Yeah, it's the holistic approach. It's not just simply the numbers of any individual sites. Yeah. So, so the the CMA's report on the planning system makes what certainly to my reading are comparatively familiar recommendations. So reduce determination periods, uh, require more rapid consultee responses, speed up plan making, etc. But but I'm interested in relation to those recommendations or build out rates to 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 uh, to drive more non speculative house building, well, which I mean RSLs, etc. So this, the CMA identify this as a potential opportunity area. Even self build, Chris will be pleased to hear. Is is it realistic? I think you've got to support any effort that gets more, to use maybe a bit of a poor analogy, more players on the pitch, that you've got to have more people in the market delivering homes, you know, whether that is through the speculative model through us and whether that is more self-build, custom build, it's more RPs uh, doing more. You know, there was a great change to, I think, grant funding last year, which allowed them to invest in estate regeneration as long as it delivered more homes. But obviously, since then, there's a massive increase in the kind of retrofit challenge and the amount of funds that RPs need to need to sink into existing stock so you need to kind of find a way to get those those players back involved and back in and delivering new homes you look at build to rent uh, private rental sector you know again an absolute uh, space in the market for them but they've got to be delivering the right sorts of homes it's all well and good saying yes that's brilliant let's increase the amount of non-speculative house building but is it delivering the sorts of homes that the country needs you know it's great you know, uh, rental towers going up in a lot of the big urban areas. Yes, there is a that is soaking up a need, but is it where the most need is? So I think there's there's absolutely scope for those players, but it needs to be um, the right types of homes delivered. And then you know, looking at uh, self build, custom build again, absolutely a place for them. And I think we're seeing local plans, certainly Barra, seeing local plans come through where uh, there's an increasing requirement, whether that's five percent, ten percent, whatever percentage of uh, strategic allocations have to be allocated to self-build um, or custom build which is great but actually can you go one step further than that because actually do a lot of self-builders want to build their dream home their you know fantastic architecturally designed home on part of a larger development site yeah maybe i'm not convinced so actually is there more fundamental change in terms of a set percentage or a set number of units to have, that have to come through a local plan um, on our set self-build custom build sites are there more actors that can help to deliver that i don't know so final question for me before handing over to the others um what do you envisage will happen from here well fundamentally i just hope the government will listen and they will engage um with the industry and um, there was a helpful email that i, I hadn't actually spotted for but it came out from the hbf uh, yesterday i believe that the DLUC have committed to responding in three months i think from the issue of the report um to which was a helpful flag i hadn't realized that so I, I kind of from our perspective we just hope that that response is informed 
by talking, by engaging with that report and by talking to the people who were essentially involved in putting that report together and giving the evidence to the CMA. So three months, the initial starting point and beyond that, who knows, but hopefully it's it's positive in it and whatever changes come forward are, are aligned with, roughly aligned with what the CMA say. Um, thank you, Chris. Mary, do you have a question for Chris? Yes, as you as you um, mentioned, I'm going to come back to this abs- absorption rate uh, point. So the report identifies that um, house builder build-out rates are aligned to local absorption rates, which is sometimes less than theoretically what developers could build out over a period of time. So my question really is, is that inevitable or um, or could delivery be tweaked in order to influence the model? Mm. That's a very good question. I suppose take, taking you know a, a personal standpoint, I think it is inevitable. I think you know the 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 kind of large and the major house builder model is to, is is inherently speculative. You've got to take a you know a plausible, realistic assumption on um, second hand prices, the rate you're going to deliver that, the rate that you can sustain those prices, because that's what you put forward. Um, in the land bid so you're, you're governed by those kind of laws of supply and demand like I said for the kind of economic headwinds that sit behind them so I think it is inevitable to, to a degree but I think you've got to when we're talking about you know increasing supply um, and increasing the number of homes delivered you've got to work with that and like I said get those more players get more diversity I think on sites on strategic allocations for example getting developers to look at um, you know there was the deal that Barrett did um, last year with with Citra for rental to um, to offload a large amount of housing because that was immediate delivery and we could get people moved into those homes as soon as possible. So I think it all comes back to getting that diversity of tenure. More permissions means you're going to be delivering more. You're going to be delivering uh, a greater variety of homes. I mean, we could... Uh, sorry, am I allowed, am I allowed a little bit of a follow-up? I mean, it's quite an in- interesting point as to um, whether in the future planning policy seeks to um, p- put an onus, as it were, um, on house builders to open up, um, you know, through policy, through 106 uh, obligations. That might be another way of tweaking the model, as it were, rather than sort of harsh planning permission now, if you don't build them all out by X, you lose the, you, you lose the permission. So, how do you, how do you mean when you say kind of open up through? Well, I, you're you're suggesting that really one of the solutions is more players, and I'm saying if a local authority is reliant on a very large strategic site, they might in the future have a planning policy which seeks to um, obligate them to open up that site to um, mm. more. Oh, sorry, yeah, that, that's what I'm getting at. Where currently policy doesn't tend to do that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. I fully get that, and I, I think fully support that. And I think that that should be considered. I think you've you've got you know these these large sites that, like I said, some of them may have a small percentage for self build, for mm. example. But I think there mm. there can be a lot more that's done there. Maybe maybe some more thought that's gone into those policies. You know, there's going to be probably yeah. some fundamental chase sitting behind that to like yeah, you're right. Open up those strategic sites and actually look at really how are those brought forward. And it's not the kind of the the, the traditional model mm. for that. So I think there is absolutely scope. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mary. I never thought you'd be the advocate for a command economy. That's one to come back to. Um, talking of which, Chris, do you have a question for Chris? Uh, yeah, I do. Nice link there, Paul. Uh, um, so, yeah, I mean, it does say in the report, doesn't it, that planning takes a protracted time. And so they recognise there's obviously a delay problem. I found reading it, uh, it was like therapy in many ways. Everything that you know you, you say and you think and you get frustrated about is there. And I agree with you, you want it to be listened to. I mean, one thing which would help would if we didn't have to have all these appeals into allocated sites. Hey, guess what? I'm in Maidenhead and I've got a two-week inquiry on a site that's allocated for 350 houses. We're promoting 350 houses and it was recommended for approval with no technical objections. So... It would help. And then James and Ricci is up the road in Buckinghamshire, and he's got another one that starts it on Tuesday. I mean, that's got to stop, frankly. Um, uh-huh. But what are your, what would you say are three things that could really speed the system up now? I'm asking okay. for a friend. <laughs> 
Oh, I, I think you, you can't get away. Your number one has got to be resourcing LPAs properly. I don't. You, you can't shy away from that. And I think the the pots that have been announced by government, whether you, whether you call it the, the super squad, whether you call it backlog busting, that is just not enough. That is fundamentally not. What, I can't remember what what the funding was. Twenty six million. What's that? Maybe one planner in every LPA for one year. I think that's what it comes down to. If that. Yeah, yeah, three million for um, you know, and talking about really what why officer for each authority probably. Yeah, that that is you know that is fundamentally not enough. LPS continue to be in a, in a an absolutely critical resourcing position, and that means you're getting you know the, their workload soaked up by appeals, by almost kind of needless work a lot of the time. Um, you know, if we're going to deliver three hundred thousand homes a year or increase that above three hundred thousand homes a year, that's got to equate to more investment into local planning authority there's no getting around it. you can't tweak the system here and there and almost make do amend with the resource that already exists you've got to get more resource in there's there's no two ways about it and that's the only way you're going to do that is through funding and whether that is straight funding pots whether that is actually exploring ring fencing properly and not 88 percent of people responding saying you should ring fence and then saying decide not to, we're deciding not to ring fence it so you've got to you've got to get the funding. You've got to raise maybe that's raising planning fees, reinventing those fees, but making sure that that's allocated to um, low, uh, LPA resourcing. And then secondly, and kind of links, I suppose, your kind of intro to this question. And I don't know whether it'll be a bit um, contentious, but I'm really in favour of something like a national scheme of delegation, or at least of harmonising LPA schemes of delegation in that. So do you have a site that is, you know, actually Bar- Barrett have got examples where it's an allocated site so it's democratically approved you've got it then gets outline permission again democratically approved at committee you then get reserve matters and it's refused at committee and goes to appeal because it was called in on a spurious reason There was no evidence behind it but it was called in for a spurious reason went to committee and went down and now we're five months six months into an appeal process in that so do we need to look at is there if it has gone through a certain number of stages is uh, officers determine it to be in line with all the relevant adopted local plan policies is that something that should go through on a delegated decision and i think that there's local authorities are so different you've got reserve masses that will go through on you know five six hundred homes that will go through on a delegated approval and then you've got schemes of 50 units which have to be reported to committee even if everyone's on board they have to go to committee which increases that risk so i think there's a real opportunity area there which is a very personal opinion like i said maybe a bit contentious um, and then thirdly, I guess maybe a little bit left field, but I, I try to engage a lot with the deemed discharge of planning condition provisions, you know, which they, you know, introduced, what, I think nine, 10 years ago, 2015, I think it was. Um, but they've got so many caveats to them. They're just not, they're just not well used. And conditions are essentially a, a real drag on officer time when they should be dealing with the applications and, and the schemes that um, that matter and, and deliver homes. Um, not to say the conditions aren't important, but they should be focusing on those. Um, sometimes needlessly held up by statutory consultees. So actually, could could you look at an expansion of those deemed discharge provisions that will just open up sites coming forward that you're not waiting on days, months, weeks, years for conditions to be discharged and in some instances never discharged at all? So that would be my probably left field uh, final one. Well, thank you very much. I have to say, I can see why you got your job, for goodness sake. And that second one, you added to one nodding. Uh, so thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers, Paul. Thank you very much, Chris. Sasha, do you have a question for us? I do. Thank you, Paul. Chris, you, you've just talked about uh, about delegation, etc. cetera. Let, let's, let's be rational and reasonable in the sense that obviously the politicians are incredibly powerful in the planning system and the politicians are heavily influenced by local residents, objectors, interest groups, etc. And we're in an era where many locals feel incredibly angry about new development proposals. And I just wondered, what, what's the approach of Barrett to, to kind of changing the current status quo, which is general anger, if not fury, towards a lot of the proposals that you that you find your your companies involved in how how are you addressing to change the dynamic of the perception of your developments mm-hmm. so we've 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 done a lot of work internally looking at, at how we engage with the community because it's it's 
and so we've produced um like a community consultation toolkit best practice guide for instance internally that all our divisions um should be using we're, we're in the the midst of a project with well north enterprises which is run by lord Mawson, looking at how we um can capture social value and drive social value creation um in our schemes but that's kind of what we're doing but but fundamentally that's driven by you need to go in and understand what communities want at the very start i think you know that there's a sense which yeah you know, you'll never completely overcome it but there's there's always a sense of well i'm having these homes thrust upon me and i'm seeing absolutely nothing in return and i and i think developers you know maybe are but also can do more to actually get really get into the throes of the low community do the research go in meet people meet groups to understand what that community want can a scheme can our scheme deliver that or can an allocation deliver that and actually deliver it as we say we're going to deliver it you know do what you say you're going to do and again we, we've had um schemes what one rings a bell um that I, I used to do a bit of work on in in essex where um you know huge public um and political kind of outcry to the scheme it was just just a reserve matters but huge outcry to it but we actually you know went in there laid the groundwork met with the people understood the concerns that they had with the site the neighbors and worked with them and uh, delivered things over and above uh what the 106 had we delivered a we kind of uh, were speaking to the parish council they had a, a local village war memorial for example was really poorly used on a road junction you know on in you know in november it's going to be a horrendous um uh you know it could be a really uh, horrendous weather for example just wasn't able to be used so we're like, okay well what about if we we've, we've got space we've got huge amounts of pos why don't we relocate and we'll create a really nice memorial space recreate this in our scheme and that, that went down fantastically really well used you know had a, had a great launch had you know the local mp down there everyone out there that um would usually uh, visit that that memorial now did it on our site and they're seeing the benefits that can be brought to a community so i think you've got to do that you've got to you've got to build on that and you can't underestimate or get away from engaging the community identifying what they want and then delivering on what they want and then and being quite frankly from a developer standpoint shouting about it and saying this is what we've done and you're never going to win over 100 percent of hearts and minds but i think that's a bloody good start um thank thank you sasha particularly thank you for not standing up in your sauna that's most appreciated <laughs> um tell you why last but standing up because no I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll edit that out. Don't worry about it. It won't go out in the live version. Um, uh, and last but by no means least, uh, Charlie, do you have a question for Chris? I, I do. I'm going to try and manage the sound. Uh, what a great advert for not doing our show live uh, in person. How, how bad we are at all the tech. <laughs> I can't, I can't Sorry, believe you two couldn't work out that if you're in the same room, you're going to get feedback. I mean, that's yeah. just so village. <laughs> yes. Indeed, indeed. Sorry about that. Um, Chris, my uh, question really goes back to the, the CMA's uh, recommendations. And um, what I'd be interested to hear your thoughts of, of the various recommendations that they um, have put forward for addressing the, the identified problems that they found, what, in your view, are, are the most implementable? Uh, what, in your view, will have the most impact? So, I suppose, you know, d- say day day to day first before we maybe start getting to the, the more kind of meaty um stuff you know the statutory co- review of statutory consultees yes that's all that's already underway you know that is probably the number one issue delaying schemes and preventing schemes from from coming forward at the minute so that is a hugely welcome set that that's already in play we don't quite know the outcomes of, of the review that's been ongoing for the, the the last couple of months but fantastic to see the cma kind of endorse that review as well and, and particularly look at you know, not just kind of maybe rationalising this to consultees, but is there a deemed green light if that's if they don't respond, for example? You know, that that is a hugely uh, positive step. And then as well, and I, I mentioned it earlier, planning fees got to be ring fenced to it. I think you you absolutely cannot get away from that. And I think internally, you know, we've had a few discussions, and I know how, how uh, robust this actually is, but I think it was just on the too difficult pile. When the government did their planning fee increase, it was, it was great to increase. But I think you've got to amend some pretty fundamental legislation. I think whether it's local government finance acts or something like that to actually ring fence those fees. So it's built on the too difficult pile. So that need that absolutely needs to be uh, revisited. And then, like I said, the, the kind of more meaty stuff that the, that the CMA recommended and um, housing targets. You know, absolutely unambiguous 
uh, clear national and then from a personal perspective regional housing targets I think would are, would be fantastic to it and I think quite easily implementable you know and whether that is continuing to, to look at household projections which the CMA um, look into whether that's a maybe move to like a stock based increase approach which which we've talked about which uh, the HBF I think recently talked about in um, I don't know if it's a, a 10 point plan that they put out at the tail end of last year so you can't again get away uh, from that and then probably getting to the end really enfor- proper enforcement and monitoring of local plans and actually properly incentivizing those local plans to come forward so do you look at linking um, HIF funding for example to an up-to-date local plan if you haven't got an up-to-date local plan in place that sets out your economic and infrastructure priorities can you access that funding I think would be a massive character actually getting those local plans in place if you don't have local plan in place you haven't got a look you haven't got a sh- you, your um you haven't got a look in to it and then putting getting that along with you know effective sticks really you know I don't think we can absolutely not look at say finan- financially penalizing local authorities they're in a dire state so you can't say we're going to take more money away from you or you know cut funding um but I think those kind of positive financial in- uh, incentives but also you know having real planning sticks associated with it so strengthening the presumption presumption in favor if you haven't got an up-to-date local plan in place for example you know you look at the the brownfield presumption that's kind of the, that's going through consultation at the minute yes it's obviously very limited and of an odd consultation i suppose in in my eyes but you know is is there scope there for for that to be rolled out a bit further that strength and presumption if you haven't got a local plan in place so more effective kind of carrot sticks monitoring incentivization for that um, and then very lastly I think it, it's go back to what I've said a couple of times that diversity of player on the pitch I think looking at local plans and looking at more effective policies say for SMEs you know not just requiring you know 10% or looking at them through windfall sites but actually allocating specific sites for SMEs on there and I think that that would potentially go how, how robust that'll be or how well that'll work I don't know but I think that would be a really good step Thanks, Chris. Really, really fascinating thoughts there. Back to you, Paul. Uh, that that was Charlie's uh, uh, self uh, note to turn his microphone off. And guess what? It worked this time around. I'm most impressed. Um, Chris, thank you very much indeed. We, we've had a lot of traction in relation to the chat, particularly in relation to this notion of um, uh, having a delivery strategy, which includes potentially opening up big sites to uh, to other players mm-hmm. in relation to that. Maybe a delivery strategy at the time of consent, maybe something to think about. So, what we'll do is, we'll, as with all our guests, we'll copy all the comments and the questions and we'll make sure those go go to uh, Chris. I was particularly struck with Dave McMullen's uh, comment that he's just got consent for 500-odd, plus lots of other stuff. Uh, see why we'll know where. Allocated site, not one objection. Delegated hours took 855 days to get consent. Lack of resource in local authority and consultees was a factor. That, that, that that's your object study in in one one paragraph yeah uh, and the cma report un, undoubtedly uh, validates that experience and self evidently government needs to do something about it with of whichever hue so chris thank you so much for coming on the show and back to you charlie and i will now turn my microphone off thank you very much for having me thank you we get, we're getting the hang of this now finally just as the show comes to an end uh thank you you're absolutely right all of the number of them cases probably all of us have done the that have either been non-determination or allocated sites or both as a proportion of planning appeals that we've done over the last year or, or, or more is it's extraordinary. So no, I agree with that. Chris, thank you. We, I think the number of comments, the range of comments, both in the chat uh, and the Q&A, here is the man himself finally escaped his laptop. Um, the number of comments says, uh, says everything, actually, about about the importance of this issue, this report, and the, and the value that your perspective has offered today. We probably could have gone on for another hour. Uh, you're talking through this, so so heartfelt thanks. As Paul said, we'll send you on the on the questions and comments for further consideration. Um, we're going to be back um, in two weeks' time for our last episode before Easter, um, uh, which is in the afternoon after the LPDF lunch, uh, which sounds like a good idea right now. Uh, hopefully, we'll all be coherent um, by by five thirty of that day. Uh, but in the meantime, take care, look after yourselves. Thanks again, Chris. Please don't forget the uh, charity donation. Have a look at our website for the details, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Thanks, Chris. Chris. Thank you. Bye. Grace. Thank you. Bye-bye.